Well, happy Monday and welcome to Axe TV. Tonight we've got a fantastic guest, someone I really wanted to have on, the Mayor of, of Westland, His Worship Bruce Smith. He's going to be talking to us about a bunch of topical issues, how the restrictions thanks to COVID are affecting the West Coast and the South Island more generally, uh, the, the power scheme that could have fueled 12,000 homes with electricity but unfortunately was stopped by just 12 kayakers, significant natural areas or SNAs as they call them in Wellington, and finally the Three Waters where he's been one of the most vocal and articulate opponents of the government's arrangement. Of course, we said we'd do at TV every night that Auckland remains at level four. So while it's terrible news for Aucklanders, not entirely unforeseen, but bad news doing another week at level four, at least one silver lining is that we've got another week of at TV coming at you. And just looking at that situation, we're still at level four, the longest stretch of level four yet, for the simple reason that there are these unexpected mystery cases continuing to pop up. People show up at the hospital for a totally different reason, don't have any symptoms, they test them, and guess what? They have COVID. The question is, is this part of a wider outbreak where there are many chains of transmission circulating, or is it simply a case of a little bit of bad luck? The only way to know that is to do a lot more testing, and the problem is that they simply aren't doing enough. 5,000 tests are actually fewer than 5,000 yesterday, fewer than 5,000 on Saturday, and that is out of over 1.6 million Aucklanders. In order to get to the bottom of what is really happening out there, we need far more testing. We've talked a lot about saliva testing. They simply aren't doing enough of that. But we've also talked about rapid testing or point of care testing or self-testing or home testing, whatever you like to call it. It's the idea that you have a simple device, not too dissimilar, to a pregnancy test that you can actually use to find out if you have COVID in minutes. You may have seen on TV one last night, Professor Mary Louise McClaw from the University of New South Wales who pointed out, if you do a personal rapid test two days in a row, the chance of detecting COVID is as accurate as if you do a nasopharyngeal test. Imagine if we had tens of thousands of people doing those tests every day, Hell, it could even be hundreds of thousands if we really wanted. And we'd have a far better chance of working out whether there really is COVID circulating that we have to be careful of, or whether it's just been a total fluke that some of the people showing up to Middlemore Hospital and getting tested for other reasons turned out to have COVID. It's too expensive not to know what that answer is because it's a billion bucks a week. And when you think about all of the other things that we could afford if only we had that sort of money in the future, it's just far too expensive not to know and to spend an extra week at level four just to be sure, as the Prime Minister likes to say. ACT believes that if level four doesn't work and we have to keep it going for weeks to come beyond this week, it's seriously time for the government to reevaluate its overall strategy. Can it hold on to level four, which isn't working anyway, and is destroying so many livelihoods and businesses? Or is the government prepared to start re-evaluating its strategy and say, look, we need to move to elimination with a much lower level of restriction at the, uh, over the next few months until vaccination levels are high enough that we have other options of battling COVID without lockdowns? One thing's for sure, that what we're doing right now is barely working. And if it carries on for another week, it's gonna be so destructive. It's gonna be time to change course and consider other options. A better bespoke level of restriction to get us just through to vaccination rates being high enough without overwhelming the hospitals and better testing technology so we're not flying blind through this outbreak. That's just a few of the thoughts that we've been sharing today about how our country should deal with the up with the next few weeks and months. But it's now time to bring in a very special guest, as I mentioned, Bruce Smith. Bruce Smith has got to be the best mayor in New Zealand. And just to give you an idea, I spoke to Bruce this morning. I said, look, I'm really grateful you're gonna come on ACT TV. Just wanted to talk through a few things. 
He said, look, I'm, I'm not sure where I'll be tonight. I'm on the road. Uh, there's been a lightning strike against a fiber optic cable and as a mayor in our community, uh, it's my job to drive down the coast, find out what's going on and see how I can help. So I don't know where I'll be. He's ended up staying in at a friend's house for the night, getting himself connected so that he can be on XTV. He's also someone who's made a very articulate video critiquing the government's three waters policy. It's been sent to me so many times. If I watched it every time, I'd be about 67 by the time I finished. He's also stood up against the significant natural areas. Another thing we'll talk about tonight. And standing up for the West Coast, I think is so important for New Zealand because it's a place where in many ways New Zealand was born. Actually, it's a place where the Labour Party was born, but that's another story. The West Coast is a place where people do practical things to create wealth and yet so often run up against the regulation state that is making it so difficult for New Zealanders to make a difference in their lives and create more wealth. Bruce, it's a real pleasure to have you on tonight. Thank you for making yourself available, especially when you're battling lightning strikes on the West Coast. Uh, great to have you. And um, how are you going? Well, look, uh, it's a pleasure to be here, David. And, and uh, we've got a few little uh, weather issues, but uh, no, going well. The, the um, Westlanders uh, has been out of uh, FPOS cell phone phone connection since about 10 o'clock this morning. So it's uh, very, really hard on our businesses, very hard on our businesses. Yeah, I bet. So, And what's the, um, what's the prognosis for getting it restored? Is it clear yet or is it still up in the air? Uh, well, when I drove past them uh, tonight, coming up uh, here to Greymouth to, to be able to take part in this, uh, there were chorus fans everywhere. So uh, we live in hope. But if it's not today, it'll be tomorrow. And if it's not tomorrow, it'll be the next day. Well, good on you. What a, what a great mayor uh, getting out on the scene and uh, seeing what the council can do to actually help with a situation like that. Um, let's just talk about, run through a few things. Um, one thing you mentioned to me that, that we hadn't planned to talk about tonight originally, but I think is really interesting, uh, is the power scheme that would have generated electricity for 12,000 homes. And uh, as you put it, was, was stopped by a dozen kayakers. So 12 people can stop 12,000. Uh, what's going on with our resource management law there? Well, it was probably the biggest shock that most of us on the coast have had when it was turned down by uh, Minister uh, uh, Minister Parker. The the scheme is on the Waitaha um, River. It's a run of river scheme, which means that it, it doesn't dam up. It's, it, it takes the water out the side. Uh, it produces enough electricity for 12,000 houses. And, and, of course, on the West Coast here, we pay some of the dearest electricity in New Zealand. And that's because of the distance the line's got to come across. We get nearly a 20% loss of electricity coming into the coast uh, from line losses. And, you know, it's the, the company uh, Westpower, it's a $120 million project. It was fully funded. It was backed by our community, backed by iwi, backed by the local dock uh, 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 people. And, um, Wait a second, backed by the local dock people? It was. Uh, they, were, wow. they were fantastic. They were fantastic. And, and it, uh, it, it uh, went to Minister Parker to be evaluated, um, and uh, it came back that um, it was turned down. You know, on the West Coast, when we get, uh, we get the, the Alpine Fault moving, we're going to need to be self-sufficient in electricity and have various forms, various methods of getting it. And the White Howe Power Scheme, it's just a no-brainer. So, so everyone was in favour except for David Parker. I just think it's such a great example of that one of the challenges that New Zealand faces is that it's so difficult to get practical stuff done. And I'd make the argument it's similar with timber supply. So difficult to build sawmilling capacity. Uh, the people that own the current ones have cornered the market and people trying to get timber are paying the price for that. And then people say, well, there's not enough electricity and there's not enough sustainable electricity. You try and build a, a relatively small hydro project, but not small if you're one of the 12,000 homes, uh, not small if the West Coast could be made self-sufficient. And all of a sudden, uh, you're blocked by basically ministerial fiat. I, I think that just encapsulates so much of the, the challenge that we're facing. Look, 
Um, what, what's the prospects of it? If the government changed, could it change? What, what would happen then? Um, I suspect if uh, government changes, it'll be approved. Okay, and we're working on that. <laughs> look, the best of luck on it. We'd, uh, we, look, I'll be down there with a shovel. I'll be the first man down there. Good on you. Hey, um, just to change gears a bit, so something that I know has really riled up people on the West Coast is the significant natural areas where uh, a council is empowered to basically look at a person's property and uh, declare that a whole lot of it is what's called a significant natural area. They basically can't do anything with that land that's not already consented. It's, it's really a massive um, expropriation or um, confiscation, really, of, of property rights with no uh, compensation. Um, tell us, what, what's the state of play with SNAs, as they're called, in Wellington on the, on the West Coast? Well, my, my view and the view of many West Coasters is that it's an attack by legislation on private property rights. And, and the government wants parts of private land protected for the people of New Zealand, and I understand that. Uh, on the coast, we call this attack the Five Ugly Sisters. And the Five Sisters are significant natural hazards, uh, outstanding natural landscapes, sites of significance to Maori, outstanding natural features, outstanding natural characteristics. And our one plan committee that uh, I'm a member of has been advised that 25% of all private land on the West Coast uh, is going to be covered by an SNA. That might be all right in some places, but 87% of the land in Westland is in dock control. It's already a significant uh, natural area. You know, it's, the, the land is protected. So if that's not bad enough, in behind that comes the Natural Build uh, Environment Bill. And we've just gone through and made a submission on it because it's proposing that all of those people who have to get a resource consent because they're covered by our plan, um, it'll have to go to a new panel, a new planning committee. And that committee is going to be made up of an independent chairman appointed by government, a DOC nominee, a one representative from our three councils, and EWU will have either two or four representatives. And so the delays and the costs and the impossibility of getting through the system uh, on your land, on my land that we own, is going to become a, a major, it's a heartache now, it's going to get much worse. It's a really good place to pick up a, a theme that, that you were talking about just before the show, which is this idea of uniting New Zealand and creating the conditions for, for more wealth um, versus dividing people and dividing current wealth uh, in order to, to try and achieve some sort of political goal. I mean, it seems to me that what, what would happen under this new natural and built environments uh, idea or act is that all of a sudden uh, you don't own your property. You have to go and ask this new panel uh, for permission to develop or use it. I mean, what's that going to do to confidence and investment and basically the ability of coasters to provide for themselves? Uh, well, it's going to be disastrous because we, we'll be at 91% of our land are fully controlled. And, you know, we've, as coasters, we are one people. We've always been one people. Yes, we have iwi, we've got two renangas, but we are one people. We're being divided into tribes. And it's most uncomfortable, it's unpleasant, and it's despicable. It shouldn't be done. We should be working together as one people to achieve uh, results for New Zealand. And this is going to this is going to put us against our neighbours and our friends. It, seem, it seems to be a, a theme right through New Zealand politics is this idea that instead of focusing on the common humanity of all coasters, all New Zealanders, all, all humans, actually, um, we're obsessed with trying to find divisions and, you know, sort of categorise people or commodify people into identities. Um, it's not something that's worked well through human history. In fact, a lot of New Zealand's history has really been fighting against that. Uh, and yet all of a sudden, you know, the, the people that fought against the Springbok tour, for example, 
um, are almost trying to reintroduce the sort of categorization of people. And I, I can't help but agree with you, your characterization of it. Um, I, I don't want to skip on too fast, but there's so much that we wanted to talk to you about. Um, so the, the next issue, um, three waters. So you, you made that video, 15 minutes long. It's well worth the, the watch where you basically laid out what it means for you. Now, we, we don't have 15 minutes, but where is Three Waters up to from a Westland perspective? And what do you think will happen next? Uh, look, I, I can, uh, from a Westland perspective, it's really simple. We've gone out to, uh, we've engaged with our ratepayers. Uh, I, I can tell you, as of this morning, uh, we had, we've had twice as many uh, submissions returned to us as we did with our LTP. And 90, uh, just a little bit over 98% want us to opt out. Um, they've all got various reasons, and some of the language is very strong. There's some people very upset about it. Now, we're the same. There are, there are other areas, Grey District, Waimakariri, Huranui, right around the country, the same result is happening. So where, where I think it's at is that um, uh, by the end of September, we will be advising the minister that, uh, if, the, if the information that we have is all we're going to get, uh, we will be out. We, you know, subject to um, if something comes up that we don't know about, that's fine. But we, we're not. Uh, we, we, we have to back our ratepayers, and and the democracy starts from the ground up. It doesn't start in Wellington. Democracy starts with my people in Haast, Fox, Friends, all the way up to Karamea. Absolutely. And so, I mean, this is a real collision course because you're, you're required to consult your people under the Local Government Act. You're supposed to take the consultation seriously, although not all councils always do. If you're getting 98% return and a, you know, a bigger return than you got even on your long-term plan, um, then there's no way you in good conscience uh, can go back to the government and say, this is all car pie. Uh, you're going to have to say no. And then what do they do next? And I think we're going to have a big battle in Parliament because I suspect that they're going to throw their toys and try and use legislation to force you into it. Um, I, I don't know if they realise quite what a fight that they're, they're buying, but I'm, I'm glad that you, on behalf of your um, constituents in, in Westland, we had Cheryl Mai, the Mayor of Whangaurau, um, just the other day, you know, m making a similar uh, pitch that you know, fundamentally mayors have got a duty to their um, citizens and constituents, and they're just completely at odds with this government. It's going to be, it's going to be a massive collision, and I just wonder how far this government will try and go. David, I'm as a mayor. My role is to represent the views of my ratepayers to Wellington. My role is not to take a crazy idea from Wellington and try and sell it to my ratepayers. The MPs can do that. But I'll tell you Which what. I'm, I'm guessing the Department of Internal Affairs thinks that is your role. Yeah, well, they, well, they may think that, but it's not. And, and it's the role of the MPs. And, and uh, the thing that's missing in action at the moment, we haven't seen one MP out telling my people, the people of Grey District, the people around the South Island, I haven't seen one MP out saying, hey, this is a great deal. We're going to give you seven cents in the dollar for your water assets. And in the case of Westland, we have uh, 117 million of assets, and we're going to give you 11 million for them, and, and it's great. And so the advantage got, is it's going to be more efficient because so we've got that guy. You got that guy, Damien O'Connor, down there on the coast. Is he, he hasn't been around trying to trying to sell it to everybody. No, we don't see too much of him. He's oh, of he lives in, in the Nelson area, and uh, we don't. Oh, see that's him. a that's a pity for you and for me because he seems to spend all his time in Wellington. Uh, well, he, <laughs> I think he probably does. <laughs> yeah. um, I'm just thinking about um, just, just one final issue before we go to people's questions. We're getting quite a, quite a lot through. Um, so COVID, uh, level two, South Island. Um, you haven't had a case, I think you were saying, for 313 days, is it? Absolutely. Yeah. And uh, what, what, what sort of impacts? I mean, it's really good for people to hear because we haven't heard enough about overall well-being. We only seem to hear... Um, about, you know, battling COVID as if that's New Zealand's only mission. Um, but what, what sort of effect is it having on, on coasters and, and perhaps on the wider South Island? Well, it's been 313 days 
since there was a community transmission of COVID in the South Island. 313 days. We're in level two. Our event sector, which is just huge for the morale in our community, um, for our businesses, is on hold. Every day now, we're getting uh, events cancelled because a major event takes, they need two or three months at least to plan ahead or to pull the pin. And so they're, they're pulling the pin. And things like um, our kids have been knocked around like you wouldn't believe. No school balls, no breakups, um, no protests. Our nurses can't protest. Our groundswell people who are going to have a big protest, they, they've got to, they're going to have a, they're going to line up in lots of 50. People who want to have meetings about three waters, like there's one coming up in Nelson, there's one here, there's one in Huck. We can only have 50 people and they've got to be separated. So you, you, can't, you can't consult. And the morale in the community is disastrous. I deal virtually every day with a business that's hitting the wall. And when you're sitting there, talking to uh, two people, a man and his wife, who've worked 30 to 40 years in the tourism sector and crying in your office and they've lost everything. And every day that's happening, it's, it's quite disastrous. And so level one in, in the South Island makes perfect sense. Let us get on with the business that we're out there, that we've got to do. Let us, let's boost our communities for Christmas. It's, it's, um, it just shows a lack of leadership, in my view. You know, I, I love your style and your empathy as a mayor. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not just the big things people think about. It's, it's school balls. It's democracy. It's protest. It's consultation. Uh, and then, as you say, it's, it's people who have spent such a long period of time um, trying to build up a business and they've burnt their cash and, and lost it all. And that's, you know, I asked you, what's the, what's the real non-COVID impact on people's welfare? Um, you couldn't have summed it up better. And look, as a local politician, uh, I'm hearing similar things. I think it's about time the government started to consider both sides of the coin because COVID is very important. Um, but COVID is, is not everything. Um, so look, I, I just hope that we can both tell our constituents that there's a better future um, pretty soon. But it depends on this government uh, doing a bit more listening. Um, hey, I've just got a, a couple of questions that have come in from our, our readers. Andy from Reefton says, when will the legislation likely take effect and what can we do to protect ourselves in the run-up to it? Well, we're only speculating they're going to let... I assume that's about three waters, Andy. Um, we're, we're only um, speculating the government will legislate on, um, on, on three waters, forcing councils into it if they opt out. But in the meantime, um, Bruce, what, what sort of things can people do uh, to oppose being forced into three waters? Well, I think it's critical right around the country for um, the ratepayers like Andy to be given the chance to, to make a submission to his council. It's really important. And I don't believe that Buller has um, uh, gone out and engaged with the community at this stage. But, uh, Andy, I think um, the, the most important thing to remember is that the people have the power Get the facts, and if you have any if you have any difficulties, give me a yell. But um, get the facts together, and then talk to your mayor, talk to your councillors, because you have the power. Um, I'm just curious. I'm just curious about um, you know, what what these um, changes to the the purpose of local government will mean. Is that something that you've been engaged with? Because it seems at the moment you've got. Um, you know, resource management law reform, uh, you've got three waters, and then you've got the purpose of local government being reviewed all, all at the same time. And it almost feels like if they got one of those issues sorted at once, uh, then maybe uh, you could do the next one and the next one. But it seems that, you know, you talked about consultation being difficult. Uh, you guys are being reformed, boxed up, made efficient, and generally, um, you know, transmogrified as, as a council by this government at a greater rate than ever before. Um, what do you make of where all this comes from? Uh, it's it's centralisation. And it's, a, it's an agenda, a philosophy. Uh, we didn't vote on it. We didn't know about the, um, the Hipurpur report. 
we didn't know about all of these other things that are out there. As for um, uh, as for centralising or or um, overhauling local government, we've had it made quite clear to us that there will be fourteen or sixteen councils throughout New Zealand. Um, that uh, that Iwi will be uh, significantly represented on each of the councils, probably outsiders as well. That's not democracy. Democracy is driven from the bottom up, and and uh, it's it's where it's got to start. And otherwise, I predict it will fall over on its face. Yeah, democracy seems to be un- under a lot of pressure around the world at the moment. Uh, this basic idea of one person having one vote and being able to actually express their voice about the future of where they live. Uh, you know, around the world, there's fewer countries practicing democracy. There's all sorts of crazy people getting elected where they are still having elections. And even here in New Zealand, that, that simple idea of one person, one vote uh, is, is being overtaken by this, this centralization agenda you mentioned. I just wonder if I could ask a, a question from Sarah and Tao Mutu. Um, we've spent years planting riparian strips and stands of natives. How will the SNA legislation affect us? We've been trying to do the right thing, but it seems this change will penalise the people who take care of their land the best. Um, I don't know if you got any comments on that, Bruce. Uh, well, Sarah, your, uh, your area will be declared an SNA if, um, if it's inspected. Uh, you'll be responsible to fence it. Uh, you'll be responsible to pay the rates on it. You won't be allowed to earn an income on it. Uh, and it will, in my my opinion, it will devalue your property rather than increase the value, which is what you're doing. You're, you're doing what any good landowner would do, and you should be rewarded for it, not punished. Yeah, I, I've never heard it put better than that. I mean, usually if you improve the value of your property, um, then that's a good thing to do because people will you know, be grateful you've done it and they might pay you more for it if you wanted to sell it. But as soon as you get an SNA whacked on it, that's an additional encumbrance that actually reduces the value of the property. So once you work it all through, I mean, this significant natural area policy is actually doing the exact opposite of what we want. It it treats people who own land as if they're some sort of terrorist group, uh, and then it punishes them for doing conservation. I mean, it's actually difficult to (laughs) really get your head around it quite how crazy the dynamics of this thing are. Uh, but there you go. That's this government. Hey, Bruce, we, we're going to have to wrap up fairly soon. We're, um, we're coming up to half past, but I just wonder, is there, is there anything that, that you would like to, to get off your chest? I'll, I'll, I've loved hearing what you've got to say. I, I know our audience have too from the comments and the number of people viewing. Um, is there anything on your mind that, that people need to know about? Well, I think the power's with the people. And... If you, if you want to go down the track of being centralised, everything controlled by a limited number of people, all aspects of your life controlled, then that's your choice. My choice, and, and my father fought in World War II in the Air Force. My grandparents, went, uh, both my grandfathers went to Gallipoli, and they fought to give me the freedom that I've got, the freedom that I've got to come on here tonight with David Seymour and say what I'm saying. We do not want to lose it. And you need to be, you you want to be really selective as to who you vote for next time around. And don't sit back and be silent. Speak out. You've got to speak out. Well, speak out while you still can. We've still got to fight those hate speech laws too. And I agree with what you say. Occasionally I hear some crazy thing and I think, hmm, not sure that's why my granddad went to Monte Cassino. Um, look, Bruce, thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, thank you for the work that you do. I, I wish every district had a mayor like you who's so in touch and empathic for the people but also prepared to stand up. So all power to you. Thank you for coming on ACT TV, uh, and I hope that our paths will cross again soon. Uh, absolutely my pleasure, and, uh, and good luck. All right, thanks. And look, thank you to everyone who's been watching ACT TV tonight. I hope you found that useful. Uh, having a chat with Bruce Smith, he really is um, what a democratic representative should be, someone who is committed to freedom and democracy and taking on a range of issues that seem to be assaulting them there in Westland and actually across councils up and down New Zealand. 
Uh, we're going to keep doing ACTV uh, each night until Auckland's out of level four. So don't worry, Auckland, we got your back. And uh, until then, we, uh, so we hope to see you again tomorrow night uh, at 7 p.m. here on my Facebook page and across Act's network of YouTube and other pages. Uh, until then, good night.